Please join me again in welcoming Jamie Nairs and Julian Schnabel to the Milwaukee Art Museum. I'd like to say, before we say anything, that you've done an extraordinary job with this exhibition. I think it's a miracle. Not that it's a miracle to show the work, but it's a miracle that it exists. And it's a miracle that you have a chance to see this work, because this show is, um, it pr probably should travel and it should be seen in, in, in um, whatever major museum there is that is showing work by a living artist. I think it uh, would be appropriate for this show to be seen by as many people as possible. Uh, I mean, obviously I've known, I've known Jamie since he was James. I've known him uh, since 1977. And uh, um, my mother said, uh, a friend is somebody that knows everything about you and still likes you. <laughs> I can't remember ever having a fight. Uh, uh, we never really have had a fight ever. Uh, but uh, I think, and I know his work quite well, but I think this show is a real eye-opener. And you have a chance to really, uh, I mean, we're living in a, I'm just gonna say, I mean, I just saw the show now. So we just walked through there and it's fresh in my mind. And, uh, you know, we're living in a time where people have Instagram and they're showing what they're doing and who they are before they even know who they are. And everybody's in a rush. And uh, people are looking for agreement from other people. Uh, and they're looking for connection with large groups of people that they might not know and who will never know them. And when I look at this work and I think of the time when it was made in the early 70s living in New York City and what this work reveals, it's what art is really about, which is an investigation into the essence of being. Who are we? What are we doing? Why, what is this, what is a sphere? What, does this cement mean? What does the movement of a ball mean? What does the movement of my hand do in space and in time? And uh, you see somebody working really anonymously uh, and quietly. I was thinking, you know, what after he made, I don't know who saw the show, but say the pendulum where you see this ball. Then you think, well, what did you do that day? Oh, I don't know. I hung a ball from a... Uh, from a bridge in the middle of this, these vacant buildings and filmed it going back and forth. And I said, so why'd you eat that afternoon? Oh, we, I don't know, I think I had a slice of pizza. Uh, <laughs> but essentially, what does it reveal? And, uh, and, you know, I've made films that are narrative films and uh, you've listed some of these awards that I've received or whatever. It's very nice to get them, but they don't mean a whole lot. Uh, and so, for example, Jonas Mikas died this year. When they have the list of all the people that died uh, at the Oscars, they don't even know who Jonas Mikas is, who really was the archivist and the author of the anthology film archives and has preserved the work of, say, Paul Sharitz and Maya Deren and work that speaks to James's work also that is essential. And when I say essential, what I'm talking about is has anybody seen the movie American Beauty? It won an Academy Award, I believe. What is the essence or the highlight of that movie that was that thing that made people think, oh, this speaks to me. This is about something that is soulful or spiritual. What is that thing? Anybody want to answer that question? The, what, say it? The garbage bag. The plastic bag floating in the wind. The simplest thing of just the ineffable, the breath of the wind, which is what, as Rapound said, uh, speak, let the wind speak. Anyway, that one thing is the thing that made all that talk and all that bullshit and all that other stuff palpable and make you think, oh, that's really smart. Well, if you look at James's work, there's about 50 different endings to about 50 movies that haven't been made that are all there in that work. <laughs> Which is really the essence of what people in Hollywood or general film don't know about 
movie making, and so there is a fundamental quality to just witnessing things and noticing things that is preserved and presented in, in Jamie's work. And um, that kind of loneliness, or not necessarily loneliness, but solitude, and the commitment that one has to have to make that work is what really sticks and lives on. And maybe people don't get it when you're around, and maybe some people might be more famous, or they're, you know, maybe you heard of Damien Hirst, who's a good artist, but I mean, uh, it doesn't necessarily, and, and that's very, and it doesn't take anything away from him, but I think that there are people that do things that kind of might be fundamental and run under the, what's it, under the radar, but when you get an opportunity, it literally thanks to you, uh, to get an opportunity to see these things is a total revelation. And I don't know who's seen the work, but there are photographs, but maybe I should stop talking and let you guys have a conversation. But, it, but uh, uh, I mean, there are photographs that people might refer to close to Moybridge, or some, but that's not really like Moybridge at all. But Jamie moves his hands in a way and photographs this movement to where the images become transcendent. They look like clouds. They look like other things we've seen. They suggest things. You walk into this film where you see a black and white film of water hitting uh, the, uh, the Hudson River. And then you see black marks go in front of it and you think about just, they're about seeing. So when finally when you see a painting that looks like a Franz Klein painting a bit, the one with the, uh, um, the highway paint on it, uh, you start to see how man-made constructions uh, confront nature and there are different kind of ways that these forms coexist. And uh, there's, yeah, I always wondered as a young person, uh, how does painting compete with filmmaking? In the sense that if you see a Kurosawa movie and you see those, uh, those soldiers with the masks on riding their horses in black and white through the mud and rain, how violent and powerful it is, how do you compete with that? And the answer I found out was stillness. And so if I think of the movement in Jamie's work and then I look at, say, a painting that I happen to own, uh, a black painting with a red X on cardboard that I got from him in the 70s, time stand, stand still. A uh, form assumed its own physical body and uh, so somehow he became the poem. And when I look at him as a young man, uh, standing there with that metal bar making the circle, scratching into the wall, or using his arm and making a, a perfect circle, or using his body to invent different ways of drawing, uh, I find it heartbreaking and inspiring. So uh, it uh, was really, and the show is, it's, um, it's full of surprises and, 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 and those vitrines. Uh, I mean, the specific, 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 specificity of detail to the smallest things uh, are really um, something that's very rare to, in today where I think everything has been reduced to um, chewing gum. That's about it. Thanks, Julian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. I was I was bringing tears to my eyes here. I was, very, you know. What were the ideas and the concepts that really bound uh, different objects across time and across media? Because in a way, you've worked in circles for so many decades that it was wonderful to actually pull together work across time and across media that had to do with the same concerns. And you're right because everything in that exhibition is about time gesture and movement, and the combination of those three things. And each time you reshake the kaleidoscope, you get a different picture, but yet the parts are still the same, which is what's really, I think, quite astonishing, considering that you could easily walk into the show, at least this was my impression, mm -hmm. and think you were in a group exhibition. 
unless someone told you this is the work of a single artist. Should we go back to the 70s for a moment? No, <laughs> no, let's talk about what you just said. I am not in control of this program. No, I, I, I just wanted to say that I had the opportunity a couple of days ago to see Marty Scorsese's last film, The Irishman. Um, it's not out yet, but I know him in his office set up a screening with Thelma Schumacher, who was the editor, and my wife and I got to see the movie. It's a gangster movie. He's made gangster movies before. Mm -hmm. But he's 76 years old now, and he made a movie where the, the romanticism about being a gangster, gangster, which was part of the flashiness of the earlier films, that which I admire quite a bit, um, disappeared, but it's still the story of a gangster. And so if someone was to say, oh, there was uh, Mean Streets, and then The Goodfellas, and then he did Casino, and then, uh, oh, so here's another gangster movie. But the fact is, the guy has made movies about gangsters since he was in his 20s. And now he's in his 70s. So he's still making movies about gangsters. But what has happened is the movie that he made now, he couldn't have made 20 years ago. And the development, the nuance of the way time is represented in the movie and the way the characters, essentially we all make one movie. Or we all make one work of art. And it has many faces, and there are different variations, but essentially there's one thing that we're trying to describe, and in the process these different objects come out of it, whether they be films or still objects. But essentially, uh, when you say that, that, talking about that through line or whatever, it's all the same thing, but it's a philosophy or an attitude that is presented through these things that uh, sews together that fabric of who the artist is and what it means. Uh, and it goes beyond the artist because what it means to whatever, whatever the viewer's experience is. Just wanted to throw that in when you said that. No, that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a very important observation. Do you feel like when you two met in 1976 or 77, right. what brought you two together? Was it the, the proximity of... Circumstance. <laughs> proximity. Do, do tell. <laughs> no, proximity, proximity and yeah. just inhabiting the same places. Yeah. Yeah, we were living downtown. Uh, he had a girlfriend named Edith Diak at that time. Mm -hmm. well, before, yeah, we met before that. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> but, but we really met again with her somehow yes. where... She, uh, his work was around her place. Yes. I mean, I think that's the first time I started to see his work. In fact, he told me today I was yeah. the first person to buy a drawing from him. Yeah, Julian came to visit me in the studio. In, well, yes. And I all, didn't know that. All I had was works on, small works on paper, and he asked me how much they were, and I said, I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 and Julian offered, $50? I said, yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> and Julian very generously um, bought a few of them. And when I went round, that, that, was, my, that was my first art sale in New York. And when I, first, when I went round to, to get the money, you gave me an extra 50 bucks because you didn't have change and you said, that's for tax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. But... But over the years, you've bought, and he has a lot of nice work. He's very good at getting the best things, Julian. And well, they speak to me. I mean, and uh, there's some very beautiful paintings that he's made, and I have a, a lot of drawings from different mm -hmm. moments. Yeah. And, uh, but I think there's so much work that's in the show that basically gives birth to other things that he hasn't made yet. I agree. I mean, and when I think about color, and I think about, say, color in uh, Caravaggio's work, 
and I look at some of the light in some of the films, there are characters, there's moments in these films that translate to paintings. Mm -hmm. There's uh, things that are, uh, for example, there's a billiard table with all of the, these balls, and you have to think of, say, Marcel Duchamp's uh, measuring tape where he dropped the string and then would make these, but there's a kind of uh, John Cage-like uh, illogical organization of things that gives birth to form. And so I see paintings all over the place that are in the form of little photographs sometimes, but I know that at some moment he's gonna paint the paintings. Either that or spend the rest of my life playing three cushion caron billiards. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> I, I, I figured if Duchamp can play chess for the, you know, his, his last years, maybe billiards is my ticket. <laughs> Everlasting happiness. But I like three cushion caron billiards. But there were years that went by where uh, you know, we went through a lot of different things and he didn't have any dough sometimes and let him use my studio. And then when the Gramercy gym closed, he took the boxing ring where Floyd Patterson and Michael, Mike Tyson, I mean, a lot of different people Jose trained Torres, there. Jose Torres, all these guys. Uh, he took the boxing rings off the floor because they were closing it and he- I lived right above the place. He gave it to me as a present for letting him stay, work in my studio. And I ended up making some of my favorite paintings with those materials. So wow. there's been a real, uh, I mean, priceless symbiotic kind of exchange and, and um, but also he's very, 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 very sweet and good and a good friend and uh, a lot of people. And, and, and so it's, and it's a miracle. What lurks the behind this sweet exterior? <laughs> what did you say? I said nobody knows what lurks exactly. behind some this people that hate sweet him. exterior. We know a couple of people that hated him, but we won't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> They're dead now. Anyway. So, Julian, you're also a lender to the exhibition. There are two really important works of art that you've generously shared with our public. And I know, in talking with Jamie, there, there are some funny stories, one of which may even be a surprise to you, uh, about the objects that are in the show. Jamie, do you want to share a couple of those? I think you're referring to the red X, mm -hmm. the, the, the yellow cardboard painting. There are three cardboard paintings in the... <coughs> Street, yeah, street section. Yeah, the street section. section, right before you see the street, the movie. And there's uh, the yellow one is the, the, the kind of, this story features. Julian wanted to buy this red X painting from me. Almost when I made it, like uh, late 70s, 77 I made it, and I didn't want to sell it. I said I would make him a painting. He said, okay. And I made a red X painting for him. And I said, Julian, you can come by and see your painting. He came by the studio, he took one look and said, nah, no thanks. <laughs> and it was a great, you know, it was like, I learned right there. I, I've learned many things from Julian. I, I learned, um, you know, you can't reproduce yourself in that way. And um, so I took that painting and I painted it bright yellow and I carved it up and I made the yellow painting that's in the show there. Which is really good. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't offer that one to me. <laughs> but buried under the yellow painting is the painting that you taught me a lesson about. And there's another nice story. I went over to your studio and there was a, he was working on a big painting and there was a figure right in the middle that looked like a Native American or something. And Julian, as he does occasionally, he said, what do you think I should do on this? It's like, what do you, what do you think I should, this painting needs something? What do you think I should do? And I said, well, I think you could do just about anything. Just don't paint that guy's face red. And I went away and I came back the next day and you'd painted it red. <laughs> red face, and that's it, finished. And it was a really good painting. Well, the funny story about the X is that he didn't sell it to me, but he gave it to Edith Diak, and when she needed some dough, I bought the X painting from her. And so I do own the X painting. I know. All roads lead to Rome. Yeah, sometimes. things have a way going in circles. It's a very interesting uh, art market, <laughs> you know, that route that you took there. But it was well worth it, I it would worked, say. Yeah. That's such a beauty. Julian has been very generous to me. He gave me his studio to work in one summer. 
um, when he was on 23rd Street. And I, it was a little intimidating at first. I remember that I moved in and there were three or four big plate paintings prepared, ready to paint, naked, and in, in this kind of um, pinkish color that the epoxy has, fleshy kind of thing. And it was it's actually dental plaster on some of Is that of what them? it is? Pink it, dental plaster, yeah. And, and it, it took me a while to be able to make anything there, like for a couple of nights, because I felt these things kind of speaking to me, but but then I got I got into it, and um, that was very kind of you to give me the studio for a summer. I needed it. Yeah. So what do you want to talk about? Let's talk about let's talk about film. Okay. And the role of film in your larger artistic. Okay. 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 Let's talk about film okay. and the role of film in your larger artistic approach, uh, conceptually, materially, how does it influence the larger body of work? Because you, you have very different approaches to filmmaking, obviously. But I think there are some commonalities in the way that there's this very permeable boundary between film and the rest of your work. Yeah, I think, the, um, I think somehow the best films, my best films have a simple um, premise and I, I don't, go much beyond that. And I, th I think of them as like moving paintings in a way, especially the short ones, like block. I don't know, this is the way, where the hand just traces one city block. Um, those films have a, they're like little nuggets of information. Mm -hmm. And that was nice what Julian said about the, the thing you remember th from the film. I remember seeing that paper bag floating around or whatever, a plastic bag in American Beauty. Right. I think, hey, that's my film. They, they, <laughs> they stole my film. But they are kind of pretty simple ideas, um, but they speak, hopefully, uh, kind of larger than what they seem. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of Ingmar Bergman, or if you think of uh, Wild Strawberries, if you think of different yeah. ways that images function, uh, eidetic images, images that are not described but are let to stand for mm -hmm. themselves and then are juxtaposed to other things, they make those other things powerful. Uh, exactly. Does anybody know Roy Anderson's films? One person in this room. Amazing. Great. Swedish director, he made a movie called A uh, Penguin Sitting on a Branch uh, Contemplating Existence. Uh, you want to get that phone? Uh, it's, it's Roy Anderson calling. Uh, he made another film recently called About Endlessness. And they're vignettes. Uh, and, uh, and there's language in them, but they're very still. It's amazing what goes on in these films. And uh, if, if anybody gets a chance, they just showed the, the movie uh, about endlessness at the Venice Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it'll come out in the United States and one can get to see it. But it's funny because I was looking, I saw Luke Toyman's show in Venice, which I didn't care for particularly. But I thought if Luke Toyman's would have seen Roy Anderson's film and made paintings of those tableaus, that could have been a way to go. Um, but I think that uh, what happens in James's work is that there are, uh, you watch things, and I think one of the things that an artist wants to do, a visual artist, is give you a sense of observing observation. Mm -hmm. And I think if that happens, you feel connected to what you're seeing, and maybe it makes you feel like you're more alive. I mean, I don't know how many people saw the film that I made about Van Gogh, but there's a, there's, a, there's a line in it where he's talking to the psychiatrist and he says, um, I would like people to see the world the way I see it because I don't feel like they really feel alive. And he says, you feel like they don't feel alive? And he says, yes, I do and you feel like you can make them feel more alive through painting? He says, yes, absolutely. Um, so 
I think that uh, what does an artist do? They share their lives somehow or their perception or their activity with people that they don't know or mm -hmm. whatever, and they believe that somehow through the act of doing that they could transmit something or there's something worth isolating. Now, Ad Reinhardt said, there's art and there's everything else. <laughs> so when I look at a painting, or if I, I make a painting, uh, I was looking at a painting I made in 1979 the other day, it was in my bedroom. I see it every day, but I was looking at the painting and I thought, where the edge of that painting stops is the rest of the world. But what's going on in that thing is unendingly self-generating and it has its own time and its time is specific to that. I mean, if you look at a Caravaggio painting, it brings you into its present, whether it was painted 500 years ago or not. It's, and, and so uh, the notion of time, I think, is maybe the real perplexing thing about existence. And we're all gonna die. I mean, and you know, you have a little child there. I mean, I have a little son who's six. We bring people into this world. We're not gonna be around. They're gonna get old. They're gonna die too. What is it? And maybe there's no answer really, but art is uh, something that you can get engaged in and you feel, and if you make that thing, you can think, well, maybe it was worth it. And I can accept that uh, terminal case of life. I mean, it, it works for me. Um, but that Kierkegaard said, anxiety is a, dizziness, is a dizziness of freedom. So I still have anxiety, but making art helps. Still free. Um. Thank you. I am actually You're freer. Free. I may be, I'm not in a cage. There are people that are in cages at this moment, and, but I, I, would, I think I'm about as free as I'm going to get. I think that's one of the things that always inspired me about you, and not only myself, but I, I can't list them because I can't remember, remember people's names, but I know any number of other artists who said that they have been um, inspired by you. A lot of artists who you might not suspect, because, might, yes. You're on. Um, but because the works they don't won't talk to me. look similar, they won't talk to you. No. But, um, it was your freedom with materials, with what the paintings that you were making that was really compelling to me when I first met you. Uh, it was, you were very faux casual. You say, why not just... <laughs> well, yeah, it was like a cal calculated casualness, or at least setting it up. So it's like, what, just stick it on. Why don't you just throw some yellow on there? Like, you know, put something on there. And um, that, that you, you generally, I know you gave a kind of freedom to people's art making that I think took root in a lot of people's work. And what you two also share, especially in, um, in, in painting, is the sense of treating the work as an object, right? It, it has a physicality and a presence. It's not about image making, which a lot of painters you know, really prefer. You, you're talking about real physical movement and almost a performative type of movement that creates the work, which is still, uh, it's still there, it's still visible long after you've completed it. You know, I think that that is one, one thread certainly that I see in thinking well, about. I, I think we're both I think interested true. in process. Yeah. Uh, I would say that we're interested in imagery also, but the imagery sure. might not be the predictable imagery or an illustration of something. It's usually exactly. the result of the process. Exactly. And I think, to what extent do you think that applies, Julian, to your filmmaking too? Because they're not, when we think about traditional narrative films, Right. I think that's a description that doesn't really apply to your style of film filmmaking, and yet there is a narrative that precisely lures, I think, an audience in and enables them to start to see some of the other sort of extraordinary passages and things that happen in your films that are not about the narrative, not about the written narrative as such, the verbal narrative. I think it's very difficult, really, to talk about I mean, it's a horrible thing to explain your work. 
or to explain what you think you're doing because there are people that think they know what they're doing. It sounds great, but what they're doing might not be very good. <laughs> but they might think it's good. And then there are people that might think what they do is really great or really might, might be really, re they think it's terrible, but it's really good. Right. So it's hard to, uh, and anybody that says they, they know what they're doing is lying. So when you say, yeah, that's right, I knew that, I, that wouldn't be true. Right. Uh, I think there's a lot of stumbling that goes on. I think if I look at the show that we saw, the fact that he doesn't know what he's doing and he's trying to do something and you're watching somebody figure it out as they're doing it and then something comes out, that's the drama. And in a sense, if you see the movie, uh, excuse me for turning my back to you over there. What, who are you typing to over there? Who are you typing to? Are you taking notes or you can't hear? How are you doing? You can't hear me. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk louder. Sorry. Um, so, uh, what was I saying at that just now? I was close. I was just let me get back to where I was. Uh, okay. So, if you've seen the movie about Van Gogh, there's a scene where he comes into this crummy room. The wind is blowing, and he takes a painting that he made down in Arles, and he looks at it and he doesn't like it very much. So he puts it away and he sits there and he takes off his shoes and he kicks his shoes off and he puts another, he sees the way he put his shoes down and he pulls out an easel and puts a canvas there and he starts to paint his shoes. And in filming something like that, okay, you write, guy walks into a room, the wind is banging on the window. Uh, he, uh, he goes to the closet, uh, he grabs a bottle out of the closet, he has a piece of old bread and cheese and then he puts it on the table. Uh, he sits down, he, he looks at his work, he doesn't like it, he takes it away. Uh, and then you think, okay, what do I want to show? So somebody is basically walking around in a room the way anybody has ever walked around alone in the room. Maybe you're tired, you don't, Really, so he's looking at this thing, and then he starts to paint a painting. He's looking at the shoes, and he starts painting. And you actually see a guy make a painting of some shoes. But in the process of seeing that, the audience is absolutely engaged in watching. Is this going to end up turning to, out to look at like shoes? And finally, you see a shoe is painted. Everybody's satisfied, and then he could go out of the room. That thing of not knowing what's going to happen and watching that, that the drama could be just in discovering that thing. And you could apply that to a lot of different things. Uh, for example, did anybody read the book Perfume by Patrick Susskind? Okay, so uh, he invents this perfume. Okay, he kills some girls while he's doing it, but ultimately it's not about killing the girls, it's about the potion. And then uh, when they're gonna execute him, he pours this stuff on top of him. He has his vial, of, uh, a little drop of it, and everybody forgets what he did. They th everyone thinks he's innocent, uh, and basically an uh, orgy ensues, and he walks, basically he gets out of it, and he's not executed. Now, everybody has been blinded by this uh, perfume that he's made, so then he, What's the point of what I'm saying? The point is that everybody, the audience knows that it's the perfume. They've given away their moral compass. They've given away all of those things. They just want to see if the perfume works. So you see what's happened to the audience and they see that the perfume works. He sees it, he's in, when I were back in the movie. So he basically, not, I'm not talking about the movie that was made. I'm talking about the movie that was never made that I wrote. Okay, so it's not the movie that you might have seen that was terrible by Tom Tickford. That was terrible. But anyway, so he walks to Paris where he was born. And these people, cutthroats and criminals are sitting around this fire. And he walks up and he sees them and he, he's sick of life because nobody really understands him. So he takes this bottle and he looks at it and he says, nobody really knows how good this perfume is. And then he pours it on his head, 
And these people think, oh, that's an angel. I want to get closer to the angel. And they all get near him and they basically eat him alive and he disappears and there's just a little spot in a bottle of perfume where he was. So what I'm saying is <laughs> nobody really knows how good James Nares' art is. You do, I do, maybe some people do, but I would say in contrast to what might be popular, what people might think, the vein or the path that he's taken to describe or the things that he's made have a reservoir of really useful things in a utilitarian sense that could help a lot of people that are, would like to make art or understand what making art is about. And that is um, something that... It's partly my own fault from making things. I have a penchant for making things and then throwing them into cardboard boxes and forgetting it's a about problem. them. I think no, that it's not because art goes on. Even when we're, we're dead and we're not around anymore, these things, somebody will pick it up at some point. It's yeah. a message. I drag them out of the boxes from one years person later. To the next. Pardon? I drag them out of the boxes years later when I find them like, gathering dust in a storage and realize there's something quite good there, like you were saying. You might hate it when you make it. But quite often time changes that. You want to have more questions? Does anybody want to ask questions? Or how do you want to continue doing this? We could go on forever. I, one question I did want to ask you both, because you've been friends for a long time. And you've, you've been inspirational to each other over the course of many decades. So I don't know if we do tonight, but typically we do have young artists in the audience. What advice would you give them as they're starting out today? Didn't I just give them the advice? <laughs> be true yes but they can always one of them could stand up and say yeah or you did give me some but I'd like to know this now and they can ask if they feel like it but, I'd like to say follow your heart because it will never lead you wrong and it's so easy to be distracted from doing that and and to lose sight of what your heart may be telling you but if you really listen and follow your heart you can't you just can't go wrong. Uh, I, I would say follow your nose. <laughs> but maybe well, he's right. I think you might be right. My, my name, Narez, means nostrils. And I've been, uh -huh. been following my nose all my life. <laughs> well, maybe we'll Can open just, it up. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe just, you want I'm sorry. I just wanted to say something about narrative. Because, yeah. because uh, I'm, I'm not a narrative filmmaker that I've... I, filmmaker, although I've tried my hand at it, and we do have a Sunday afternoon series of the films of mine which begin to approach narrative. Um, I had one attempt when I made a film in New York called Rome 78, where I, where I typecast all my friends as Roman characters and had them reenact um, the Rome, the ancient Rome of their imaginations. Um, in New York City. And we are screening that film the last weekend of the exhibition, so... But I could never say that uh, it's the narrative that holds that film together. You, I agree. I could chop the scenes up and rearrange them and... Yeah, but uh, maybe it make much it's difference. fine the way it is. Yeah. And the fact is, one thing, yes, if you talk about those days, you have to think that James was in a punk band, a couple of them, one called, uh, with James Chance, it was called The Contortions. It was a great band. Uh, he one was, summer, it was the okay, hot, one hottest summer. band in New York. <laughs> I, we were already great. Yeah, and he was in another band called the Dell Byzantines. With Jim Jarmusch and Phil Klein. And so you got to think that he was with Jim Jarmusch, who was a great filmmaker in his own rhythm and beat. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I wasn't in that group. There uh, are so many groups in New York. They all... I like wasn't in any group. In fact, I wasn't. I didn't get. Maybe I didn't get along with everybody that well. But, but <laughs> you, people you, liked him. You stood alone, okay. Julian. I, uh, but he was very hip, and not in a bad way. He was very hip. He was really kind of. Uh, and and those people that are in his movie uh, Rome seventy eight, they're characters that are key people of that time in New York City, and it's worth seeing it to see David McDermott. And because uh, uh, David McDermott and Peter McGuff they made art together and 
lived in the 19th century. They basically lived in the 19th century. I went to visit them once upstate and uh, they took all the heat out of the house because it wasn't from the 19th century. I said, weren't there rich people in the 19th century also <laughs> where they had a fire in their house? I mean, I had a, a, a fur cap on my head and a coat when I was sleeping. It was fucking freezing in there. And, but these guys took everything out that wasn't from the 19th century because they wanted to be authentic. Anyway, they're in his film. Not only those guys, I mean, there's... He's particularly good. Anya Phillips is in there Great too. performer. Yeah. Um, so, but I, would, I, I just wanted to finish my thought, which was that um, narrative is, is not my... I don't really experience the world in terms of narrative. And I thought that I was not a narrative filmmaker. And, and then I made Street, which I realized is just a compilation of small narratives because the, the narrative is generated by the moving camera. Mm -hmm. And you're always wondering what's gonna happen next. Where are we gonna go? Which is the essence of what a, a story is. Where, where is this gonna go? And, and I realized that I, I'm a, sort of a, th there is narrative in my films. No, it's a very successful like narrative. And it's not only the camera that's moving, but it's the people that are doing things that human beings do and without saying anything, you know exactly that they're tired. You know they're waiting across the street. You see a guy looking at a girl's tits. You see him looking at her tits and fantasizing about them. And then you see him look down realizing he's never going to meet this girl. Uh, it's all right there. There's a million different it's scenarios. It's very that human. Are going and on. You get to and see all the little so, fragments, mini narratives. So it's a different way of it, ob observing time and, and, and film. Yeah. And it's very, very uh, useful. And that's why I was saying about Roy Anderson, because his movies, you're watching the movie and say, well, what's going to happen? But something does happen. Yeah. It just happens in a different speed. Yeah. Good point. Jamie, did you finish your thoughts? More or less. I think I've, uh, um, I pretty much said it that I'm a, I am a narrative filmmaker in the end, whether I like it or not. And you have a narrative. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's a great narrative. Actually, even like even block, which is the hand traversing one city block, that's a narrative of sorts. It's Absolutely. a line. There are a lot of lines in my in my work, in paintings, in drawings, um, and a line is, in essence, a narrative because it begins and it moves and it goes somewhere. Well, in the same way that say Richard Serra would take some lead and throw it. And suddenly you see it splash yeah. against the corner and you see what happens and it's either interesting or compelling or not. I mean, Marlon Brando said, anybody can act, but some people are boring to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so Pretty either good. it's compelling to look at or it's not. I. Do you so, remember yeah. Richard from that neighborhood, those downtown? You mean Richard Barnes? Prince? Richard um, Serra. Oh, Richard Serra, yeah, I remember. Like meeting Richard Serra at Max's Kansas City. Bryce Martin was gonna have a show at the Bikert Gallery. And I said to him, well, can you give me a ride uptown? Uh, it was winter, going up there tomorrow. He said, okay. He had a ponytail that was out there. I mean, Richard was kind of, and he, he, and he picked me up, gave me a ride in his station wagon up there, and we're sitting in the car, and he said, so, uh, what kind of paintings do you make? I said, oh, I make paintings of projective drawing tests. To draw yourself when you're 30, you're 40, uh, um, draw a family. And he looked at me and says, well, the only paintings I like are Ellsworth Kelly paintings and Bryce Morton paintings. And Frank Stella black paintings, he loved uh, those. He didn't mention that in the car at that time. I said, okay. And then we didn't say much and he took me up there, but it was always very, very, he was very, nice to me. very present and very nice and a great inspiration to me. I think in, in Block, you could, there are um, shades of hand-catching lead that he made with Phil Glass. It was Phil, a, a Phil, plumber. Yeah. Phil was a plumber. Yeah. But if you go back earlier, before he started doing that, his work looked kind of like Joseph Cornell yes. and had a sort yeah. of thing which was closer to what I was doing, but I didn't know that at the time. So it's funny how people go full circle and become whatever they 
become, but um, there were some you know, great little, people around in those days. There's a little, um, I have a catalog from a very early Richard Serra show up at Yale, mm -hmm. and it was a, like a sort of Duchampian thing, it was a, a like a birdcage full of sugar cubes. Exactly. And um, it occurs to me that those sugar cubes are like little miniature versions of the great blocks of steel that are now showing at Gagosian Gallery, yeah. in which I... I encountered one the other night on the back of a flatbed waiting outside in the street in the dark with nobody around. It's not the kind of thing somebody's going to steal so they could just leave it there overnight. <laughs> and it looked so beautiful, this great block of steel just sort of singing into the night on the back of a flatbed with no, no truck attached. It was just the back. Kind of tied, I don't think it was even tied down with chains or anything. Well, how just like, you can't move take it. Take this if you want, <laughs> if you can. Anybody want to say anything? What do you think? Questions? Okay. Yes? Uh, if it's okay, I just I wanted to say I don't know that I've ever seen two artists that have such love and respect for each other. And it's just a wonderful thing to see. Why, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What's your name? What's your name? Lamont. Lamont. There's Thank more you. of us than you might imagine. <laughs> yes. People, artists kind of tend to like other artists. I, I, I very much admire your insights and understanding of what's happening in our world and what's happening with your companion. One question I have is, um, I was struck by the similarity of your work with um, Francis Bacon's painting. Has anyone commented on that? Um, the interest in movement, um, his subjects are seen in the rest of the residents of motion. I think it's a, it's an interesting perception because um, it's not an obvious connection. But when I was a young a youngster in my teens, Bacon was my hero, and I had a, a I had a photo of him on the ceiling above my bed at school, like. Um, so I said, good night, Francis. <laughs> every every, but, every but, night I say, good night, Francis. And he, like the, um, yeah, there is a kind of movement and angst. Um, yeah, a solitary figure in a landscape or in an interior. Uh, it's funny because Francis Bacon is somebody that I thought about a lot when I was younger, too. And uh, uh, speaks to the young. Uh, but there, it's Mine. particular to particular paintings. I mean, I think he kind of got a bit of the later work. He kind of got more. The photograph sort of took over, and the things started to fit inside of the rectangle. But if you think of, say, the Van Gogh on the way to work paintings from 1954 oh, to 1957, and some of those cardinal paintings, and the sort of freedom in those things, and the uh, the double portrait of Frank Auerbach and Lucian Freud, it's about as good as it gets. And uh, I didn't want to paint paintings like, I wanted to when I was a kid, and then I didn't want to as I was getting older. But this summer, I was making a painting, and I was painting on these paintings that had um, pink material that was sewn to another pink material, and so there was a horizontal line going through the bottom of the painting. So immediately you had a, the sense of being in a room. There are no figures in the paintings. There were some marks on there, but damned if it didn't look like a Francis Bacon because it had this ground at the bottom and uh, it was cut in the middle. And so you can't, it's a beautiful thing because obviously he made an imprint in people's consciousness. And uh, uh, when he made those Van Gogh on the way to work paintings, he quoted Van Gogh who said, how to achieve anomalies, inaccuracies, and refashionings of reality to where what comes out are lies, but lies that are more true than literal fact. Pretty cool. So I think when we tried to make the movie, we tried to do that. Yeah, it might not be true, but it's maybe more true than the truth. Plus, you kind of have a little bacon moment there with, with no, with, with Van Gogh was storming through the, um, the, the 
high winds and yeah, the wind know, was with him holding onto his painting and trying to make it. Well, it looked the, like the painting that he made of Van Gogh on the way to work, yeah. which was Bacon's painting. Yeah. Yes. It's, um, Jamie, you said you don't see the world as narrative. I just don't. How do you see the world? I think I see it in a sort of more of a collection of abstractions or, or moments. I think I, I'm in, I, I see moments and things. I see, when, like, when I take photographs, I take a lot of photographs that, like everybody takes a lot of photographs these days, but, but I take my share, and most of them are something that catches my eye. If it catches my eye, I take a photograph. I don't, um, I don't m move around it and try and get a better angle. I figure if it caught my eye, that's good enough. You know, it must have some kind of thing, and um, so I just snap it. And. I'm not very. I, I'm just not very good at stories. But you know, it's not, I had I had this brain hemorrhage a few years ago, and um, afterwards I used to tell my kids um, stories at bedtime, and I used to make them up, and I was quite good at it. And you know, I had the kitty and doggy stories, and I had the pinkle and perp, the mermice stories, and every night was a different narrative. And then suddenly I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't, the stories didn't come. I don't know if that was uh, um, like a, um, a, an exaggeration or an amplification of something that was innate in me. Um, That's was, a good story. I was pretty good at those kids. <laughs> 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 That's about where it ends though. I don't think so. <laughs> but William Carlos Williams said, uh, the truth is in things. And I guess that Truth is in things. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. I think that's what Richard thinks, Sarah. In this big black box. Definitely. What is it? It's a big black box. It's kind of alive. It's a lie. Alive. Oh, but it's a lie also. <laughs> Anybody else? A living lie. Yes. I kind of set things up and then and then let it unfold. I let thing I set things up and then let them unfold in a lot of the films, even in the um, what might pass as a narrative film, my Roman film, Rome seventy eight. I would set a scene, maybe pin a script on the back of a curtain where nobody could see it and the actor could read it. Um, I thought you were going to say you'd pin the the dialogue on the back of a character and have the other character read it <laughs> while he was walking around. But the, that has happened because Brando used to go around and there would be people that would be acting with him and his lines would be written on their stomach. <laughs> or, or, I did have it on the back of someone's shield like this. <laughs> anyway, yes. Uh, your Lou Reed Berlin documentary was absolutely amazing and those versions, the live versions of those songs, completely the best I've ever heard. Can you talk about that experience with Lou Reed? Well, Lou Reed was my best friend. And Lou Reed lived across the street from me. And I was making a movie called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly at that time, and Lou called me and he said, well, I'm uh, going to do Berlin at St. Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn. The director wanted to do that. I said, so what if she wants to do it? I mean, I can't really even think about that now. I hope she's okay. I hope she's okay. So one down. Uh, maybe we could I'm all sorry, do something sorry, together, was... like all start coughing. That might be really crazy, no? Okay, no. Okay, so... Uh, uh, so Lou asked me if I could do the sets for... I was working on these Chinese paintings. They were printed, they were, they were Chinese prints that were printed on polyester and I had this group of green paintings with some resin poured on them. They weren't finished and I said, okay, uh, okay, you can have all these green paintings and we'll hang the couch in my studio from the ceiling and that'll be the greenish walls. 
Uh, and that'll be the Berlin Wall for your, but let's, and then uh, we called um, the lady who was the, uh, it's gonna cost $16,000 to get the stuff over there which they didn't have in their budget. So I said, okay, there's no money to make this. So why don't we do this? I'll put in $50,000 and you put in $50,000 and then we won't ask for anything. We will play at the St. Anne's Warehouse. We'll pay for it. We'll film it and then we'll sell the film later. And if we sell it, we get the money back. If we don't, we don't. But at least we'll make it exactly the way we want it. So I thought it was great that after 35 years where this record was seen as his huge failure, the worst thing he possibly could have done in his life, which I thought was my favorite record, um, he was gonna get to play with the original musicians and we were gonna get to mm -hmm. do that. And which, but I was making a movie in France at the time, so I thought, okay, my daughter Lola can shoot some stuff in the Chelsea Hotel with this with Emmanuel Senne, who's gonna be Caroline. Well, he thought Caroline had black hair, it wasn't anything like her, but, and then I said, well, Lola, isn't she your, she's your daughter, right? I said, yes, and my brother-in-law, Sander, actually made a thing not dissimilar where he used a spool and he put a aquarium inside of the middle and he put baby furniture in it, in water, and it was, and he turned the spool oh. around, and so the furniture was floating around, and I said, like well, my brother-in-law is gonna do, the, uh, he's gonna work on it with my daughter. He says, your brother-in-law and your daughter are gonna, what are you, out of your mind? You want me to say yes? I said, yeah, say yes. I said, okay, well, he trusted me, and they did work on this with me, and we shot him playing, and it was amazing, because he hadn't played with the band in 35 years, and he had been saving that thing up, and to see him, see it realized, you get it in the performance, and since we were doing it ourselves, I could take the cameras and put them right on the stage. And, and it was very uh, physical and simple. Uh, but it was a, when, before he died, I was sitting with him in the Springs and we, he was watching it on television. And it was the day before he died and all of a sudden he jumped up. He had, he had pancreatic cancer and he, uh, anyway, he jumped up and he says, who paid for this? The authors paid for this. And he was very happy. And it was a great thing to do together. And if anybody gets a chance to see it, it's called Lou Reed's Berlin. And, and uh, it was a really great thing to do. And he had a thing where he toured all over Europe after that. And it was a great moment, uh, particularly after it was seen as a huge failure. But it was, it's a beautiful record. But everybody want to go home now? <laughs> anybody want to ask something they need to ask? Okay. You seem very immediate. Okay. Julian, I wondered if, if you could remember meeting a guy in a pool hall in Barcelona. Was that you? No. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me, but it was a, a guy that I met in Paris. We were working at a studio. And right. uh, he came back from Barcelona saying that he, he met this guy and he took him up to his hotel room and he had this, I think it was an installation. I'm not sure what. He tried to describe it, but he couldn't. He, but he was just blown away by it, and um, he would bring it up every once. I don't think that's true. <laughs> no, because what he's taught, he's blending something. Because essentially, the first plate painting was built based on a closet that I had in this hotel room in Barcelona. Okay. And if it, if he met me at that time, there wasn't anything in that room except that closet. Well, that's what he said. Uh, Oh, well, I had a closet, definitely. I mean, the room cost $2.50 a night. I don't know why I would have shown him that thing. So I got a feeling that he sort of might have met me, but maybe embellished this thing and turned it into a painting that he imagined in his head. But God bless him. <laughs> okay, anybody else? I'm sorry. You know his name? Don Juan. Yes. You need a microphone? Can somebody give her a mic? We can do that. We can send my mic over there. Uh, here, the mic's coming to you. It's coming. 
I've done Nasty. this before. Okay. I, um, I've known James for a long time, Jamesy. And Julian, and um, is that you, I've, Barbara? I've seen, yeah, it's me, Barbara. Babs. Yeah, hey. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Anyway, I have seen James's work for years throughout, and I was at his studio earlier this spring on a studio visit. He was working on packing up the show to come here, and he was also finishing the work for the Paul Casman Monuments show and I was really blown away. And um, he had a little, a little model of the museum here with these teeny weeny little replicas of all of his paintings and things. And I have to just say, he told me how much he loved working with you and how, how gracious and wonderful all the people were here and that you asked him continually for his participation in selecting works and kind of choreographing things and he was so you know so thankful for that and i was really thankful because i thought you know i know he's working with somebody that really gets him so when i came to the show earlier i could see it was sort of like with you it, he was able she was able to create a larger work that consisted of all these little pieces of work mm -hmm. and and the flow and the entire spirit of the show is so wonderful. And I have to just say thank you. And I hope the audience, and all the viewers, are able to appreciate that this is really coming from the heart and the, this collaboration. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. We did work on. We did work on the show for six years, I think, and and the me the moment yeah the yeah. Me momentum momentum built as we uh, you know, approach the light the date the date of the opening and everything. But I've said it before, but everyone at the museum here really put in their their work, and um, David Russick, who designed the exhibition, was so fantastic. Um, Marcel, of course, who you know, who's, who is the umbrella, whose ideas really permeate the show. But um, That's true. See, seeing it in that model, you saw it in the model form, it's very helpful to, um, to move things around <laughs> like, so, like this instead of... And they must have been really tiny, like, those little tiny photographs must have been like they were. Ants. They were. <laughs> well, there are a couple of funny stories that I'll, I'll just share here because we did, um, we had, since we were working long distance with Jamie, who's in her studio in New York, our chief designer, David Russick, had a great idea of building two, we have a model here of the Baker Rowland Galleries, and so we built one for Jamie, and we sent it to New York. And when we made a move on our model, we would say, okay, now move this here. And then Jamie would replicate more or less the same well, process. I might get it wrong sometimes. <laughs> but there were very funny moments because yes, it's, it, the model was to scale, Julian, to your point, and there are a number of very small objects in the exhibition. So there were times when we were on our knees under the model looking for the one little photograph that we lost. <laughs> we know it's here, we can't find it. Um, but. From my perspective, it, it's, it's sort of unique for a director to have the opportunity to curate an exhibition at the museum. Uh, and for our staff here at the Milwaukee Art Museum, I really, um, I was so humbled and honored by the experience of working with our tremendous team because they all rose to every challenge. It's a complex exhibition. It was a difficult project to mount in just the right way. There were many challenges. Our conservation team worked around the clock. Um, because, Ted in um, the technical yeah, side Jim of Jim DeYoung and his team. Because many of the Jim. things, as Jamie said, came directly out of um, drawers and storage areas and so forth. And so many of them needed stewardship and care to prepare them for exhibition. So that was a huge effort. Um, as you, if you've seen the show, you know there are so many moments where film comes into play because one of the central arguments of the exhibition is that film is at the core of Jamie's career and that to pay attention to and understand the way the film works conceptually, materially, visually, 
is key to understanding all the other works in the show. So there are over 20 different moments where film comes into the picture, so to speak, throughout the exhibition. So from an AV perspective, it was also a very complex exhibition. And everyone, especially when they met Jamie, felt like we had to do this right. That this was an artist who deserved the very best. And we had to do absolutely everything possible and move every mountain to make the reality of what we hope to see in the galleries come true. Well, he did that, and then some. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Is that it? Well, okay, two more. Okay, there's <laughs> Last one two questions, everybody. Yes, okay. one at, yes, and then we'll get to you, I promise. I guess we got to you. Go on. I love your rubbing out the streets of New York. I <coughs> cry when I think of them. I hope that the museum buys one. I think they are They are magnificent. Really, I would buy a few things. <laughs> this is the coming together. And yeah. I love the relationship we have together. It's beautiful. Thanks. Thank yes. You. Thank you. There you go, there's a microphone. So I would like to know from Marcel how you discovered um, this work and, and um, this artist and how did you decide to create this exhibition? It's a, it's a great question. So Jamie and I met actually... You lifted up a rock and there it was. <laughs> no, it was like, no I didn't look under a rock. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened, uh, I was the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Jacksonville, and I was working on an exhibition called Slow, Marking Time in Photography and Film. And that was a group exhibition looking at works of art that evolve slowly over time. So really changing the whole viewer experience, right? So, uh, there were many objects there that uh, moved, but at very slow speeds that would take hours, sometimes days. Uh, we did really fun things like have a special menu in the cafe to fortify your stamina so you could go back and see more work. But as I was mounting that exhibition, I felt like I was one critical artist or work of art short, and it was stopping me from putting it on the exhibition schedule. I just felt like I was missing something. And I was almost ready to say, this isn't the time, I'll wait until I find that critical thing. And then, literally two weeks later, I went to Art Basel um, in Miami Beach and encountered the film Street. And Jamie, unbeknownst to me, had you know just finished editing the film, literally en route to Hot Art Basel. Bread. And there it was. And I started looking at it, and I thought, this is what I, this is it. This is what I'm missing. And immediately contacted the gallery, and then went to to meet Jamie, and we started spending a lot of time in conversation. There was a subsequent exhibition I curated called White, which dealt with all works that were made using the color white. And we included one of the road paint paintings in that exhibition. And then I started to realize, as I got to know Jamie better and started seeing more and more work, this is an incredible story. And there are, in fact, stories. There are so many different narratives that, that this artist has created. It, it's really, I felt it was beholden to me to create a, a channel or an avenue to be able to share Jamie's extraordinary work with a broader public. And that I felt back at Jacksonville when I came to Milwaukee, I felt like we finally had the right team and the right place to be able to bring it to fruition. And so I'm really so proud and, and feel so honored that we've had this opportunity. Well, I have, Much a, qu like I have a question. How come I wasn't in the white show? <laughs> We'll, we'll do a second round, Julian. Yeah. I use white. I, I should a lot say, of white. No. I should say also that um, it occurs to me that, of course, the paintings are little mini miniature narratives, also yes. the telegrammatic. They have a beginning and a middle and an end. And they kind I of wouldn't connect. even worry about that. Yeah, I don't worry about it. I'm I'm just, it it's just there, you know? It's sort of, it's like little. Um, a question that keeps miniature. just crawling up your back of your sweater. Yeah. Thank you all so much. You've been anyway, such a wonderful audience.